Well, U.S. cities that are seeing their coronavirus cases spike are warning that drastic safety measures, perhaps like stay-at-home orders, may be coming in the near future. Uh, this is as, you know, officials really try to get a handle on this disease running rampant in some places. Let's take a look at the numbers now. 41 states in Washington, D.C. are seeing a rise in daily cases. So far, more than 3.7 million Americans have tested positive for the virus, and the reported death toll from the virus has now surpassed 140,000 people nationwide. Laura Podesta reports. The coronavirus continues to spread rapidly in much of the southern U.S. Three of the most populous states, California, Texas, and Florida, are among the hardest hit. As they start to peak, we're seeing other epicenters of epidemic spread start to emerge. So you have to be very worried right now about Georgia, about Tennessee, about Missouri, about Kentucky. Experts say testing remains a major problem. In some areas, the wait for results is taking a week or more. Once a test is delayed more than 48 hours, it becomes not very useful for clinical decision making. As cases surge in California, many are bracing for another lockdown. It was a discouraging week because we just went backwards. In Florida, at least 45 hospitals had no available beds in intensive care units as of Sunday afternoon, according to data from the state's Agency for Healthcare Administration. I said four months ago, if we don't do this right, we're going to have to close down again. That's our worst nightmare, and we're going to have to do that in Florida. State governments are turning to Washington for help. With Congress back in session today, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says the first order of business will be a new coronavirus relief package. The House has already approved a three and a half trillion dollar bill. I would consider not signing it if we don't have a payroll tax cut. President Trump says he also wants the measure to include liability protections for businesses. Laura Podesta, CBS News. Well, the president continues to downplay the severity of the virus here. Uh, he did an interview with Fox News on Sunday, and he falsely claimed that the U.S. has the lowest mortality rate in the world. That's a quote. In fact, we rank seventh out of the 20 worst affected countries. Uh, he went on to say that many of the new cases involve young people. Here's what he had to say. Testing is up 37 percent. Well, that's 30, good. I understand. Cases are up. 194 percent. It isn't just the testing has gone up, it's that the virus has spread. The positivity rate has increased. There are many the of those cases. Than it was. Many of those cases are young people that would heal in a day. They have the sniffles and we put it down as a test. Many of them. Don't forget, I guess it's like 99.7 percent. People are going to get better. And in many cases, they're going to get better very quickly. All right, so we want to bring in emergency care physician, Dr. Ron Elfenbein. You are in Maryland to talk morning. to us a little bit more what the, about what the president, hey, good morning, about what the president had to say. Um, so, you know, he points out that we are seeing spikes in younger people, and that is the case. We certainly, when we start to see spikes in, in Florida, it was initially among the younger people, but, you know, inevitably, people tend to spread the virus. That's the point, that younger right. people can then spread it to older people. Um, but just let's look at younger people, because there is this idea that that, you know, it doesn't really affect younger people. They get over it, and, you know, they might be under the weather for a few days, and then they're fine. Can we talk about how this virus impacts young people? Can young people get sick? Sure. Um, yes, young people can get sick, and young people can die from it. We have reports of that happening. I personally have not seen any young people die from it, but there are numbers of people who have passed away from it and who get particularly sick from it. That being said, there was a study out in uh, in June in a journal called peer-reviewed journal called Nature Medicine that showed that 79% of teenagers and young adults don't show any symptoms at all, even though they test positive. So, you know, I think he was probably alluding to that to some extent. But uh, but yes, young people can get it. And uh, you know, there was a case report recently of uh, uh, these people that have these coronavirus parties where they try to you know, just see if they can get it and see if they get sick from it. And, and one young person passed away from it. So, yes, yes, people do get it and people, young people do get it, young people do die from it, including young children. So, you know, I know there's this theory out there, this thought out there that young kids can't get it and they can't die from it, and that is absolutely false. In general, young, young people don't get it, and in general, young kids don't die from it, but there's always exceptions. And young, we, we have, again, evidence of young people dying from it and, young pe and little kids dying from it, too. 
Dr. Alfred let me ask you about some news, uh, some late breaking news, which is that the University of, Ox uh, of Oxford has conducted a half uh, phase one half trial on a coronavirus vaccine. And the good news is that it induces this vaccine an early immune reaction. And that is from the preliminary early results. Let me read you a quote from uh, University of Oxford professor Andrew Pollard, who is the study's lead author. He says this, the immune system has two ways of finding and, att and attacking pathogens, antibody and T cell responses. This vaccine is intended to induce both. So it can attack the virus when it's circulating in the body as well as attacking infected cells. We hope that this means the immune system will remember the virus so that our vaccine will protect people for an extended period of time. Um, how heartened are you by this news? Um, I note that the study was done with uh, 1,077 people ages 18 yes. to 55 with no history of COVID-19. So um, is this good news? Is the number of people uh, in this trial enough to uh, conclude anything from it? Um, and what do you make of the science behind it? So it was a, it's a fairly you know, large preliminary study. It is a preliminary study, so I want to emphasize that, that this is preliminary data. It's a phase one. It's actually not even a complete phase one trial. So uh, you know, it's early on. Yes, it's very exciting, and yes, it's very uh, good news, but I don't want everyone to jump to conclusions. Please remember that there are 100, over 120 groups currently working on a vaccine. This is one of them. Uh, it did show that at 56 days, they were still able to to detect antibodies and a pretty profound immune response. They showed that at 14 days, they had a very profound T cell response. And at 28 days, they had a very good uh, antibody response. And as you say, there are two, essentially two ways that the immune system fights invaders uh, by, by antibodies, which are produced by B cells and the T cells, which actually attack infected cells. So uh, this is a kind of this vaccine is kind of attack is is look, working on both of those uh, fronts to kind of attack the virus from both sides, if you will. So yes, it's a it's a very good uh, preliminary. I want to say that again, preliminary study with preliminary data, but it's a fairly large number of people for such an early study, and it showed some very very promising things. So yes, we should be excited by this, but everybody just needs to take a step back and just say this is preliminary. We need more information, and we need to get. Looking at older folks, too, as you said, the, the cutoff was at a fairly young age. This was not looking at anybody, I think you said 55, over the age of 55, I believe. Right. Uh, I want to ask you about a really, really interesting case um, coming out of Missouri. So we have two hair, hairdressers working inside, working in a hair salon. They both tested positive. They were exposed to 140 different clients. None of those people tested positive. None of those people got the coronavirus. And the CDC, I believe, is suggesting that it has to do with the fact that they were so vigilant when it came to wearing masks, both the client and the hairdresser, even though they were indoors. Can you talk a little bit more about that and just the importance of wearing a mask and wearing it properly? Because I see a lot of people with masks on and their noses are coming out the top and stuff like that. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> so yeah, so this was a CDC uh, published study that uh, was in, in Missouri. And uh, interestingly, um, there were two hairdressers that both tested positive. They worked on 139 clients. Uh, none of them got symptomatic. Now, I, I just want to clarify what you said. They actually only tested 67 of those 139 people. But out of those 139, mm. none of them reported any symptoms. So uh, that was one of the limitations of the study. They could possibly have been asymptomatic and not, but they, they didn't report for testing. They were offered testing. They chose not to be tested. So. Uh, they did, again, 67 out of 139. But yes, it's very promising. And yes, it shows again what I've been saying and we've been talking about every week now, essentially, is that masks help. Uh, masks work. We know it. Uh, there's data for it. And this is a great study to, sh to show that. I was recently having a discussion with someone who, who uh, you know, not to be crass, but who said, look, if I'm wearing a mask and I can smell somebody's gas that they just passed, that mask obviously isn't doing anything to me, for me. And I said, that's not the case. It's protecting you and protecting them from the virus. It has nothing to do with what you can smell or can't smell. And, you know, so there's all kinds of people out there that, that still believe that these, you know, that these things don't work and that, that it's, it's a farce. And it's just such a simple thing. Just put it on your face, wear it properly when you go out. You don't have to wear it in your house. When you're around other people, just put the mask on and wear it properly. It's not that big a deal.
It's not yeah, that big and, a deal, you know, and it's, it's not about, uh, we're talking about droplets, not ga a gas. It's two different right, substances. Right, yeah, so, right. you know, <laughs> just like 101. Yeah, right and, and, right, and, and the other thing is, you know, I've, I've had a lot of people who have tweeted at me or who've asked me on social media, you know, uh, asking me if the mask is dangerous to wear for extended periods of time. And you get a lot of people that say, you know, my doctor says it's dangerous to right. wear. Um, and I've, you know, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a sacrifice. I started, you know, jogging with the mask early on in the, in the pandemic because we were the epicenter here in New York City. And it was a little uncomfortable. Now, four months into it, I'm biking 20 miles with the mask on, no problem. I mean, it's a, you know, it's not that big of a deal. And you know that you're doing it not necessarily for you, but to protect other people um, from your droplets. I know when I go running, I have said this to Anne-Marie, that when I'm running in Central Park, I mean, I wear the mask because I can feel droplets coming out of my nose because I'm struggling yep. so hard to huff and puff up those hills uh, up in Harlem Hill. So, um, you know, it, it definitely is something that, you know, science has proven does work. Uh, Dr. Elfenbein, always great to have you to uh, clarify the things that people will say who are not doctors. It's, it's kind of crazy. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Stay safe. Good to see you both. All right, you too.